say that didn't even Willie Joe didn't matter at all. His name should have been William. So I said, well, you know, like, uh, how about female names here? So I said, well, of course you said. They said, I'll be Willa, as in Willa Catherine. Well, that's obviously ignorance, all ignorance, when you name children Willie. But there's a greater ignorance involved in that teacher's view. Her view is that these children aren't like me. I don't think God help them if they can't make it. These are five kids I met through Wentworth. I was in a class with Wentworth in junior high school. This is the Garden Academy in junior high school in Washington. I was in a class with Wentworth. You must visualize the classroom to understand the lesson that I learned. I was sitting in the back left-hand corner as you face the classroom. I was back there. Wentworth was sitting in front of me, eight kids in front of me, one row closer to the teacher who was sitting over in this corner. I could see Wentworth's right rear. The teacher could see his left front. From the right rear, Wentworth was alive. He was reading a car magazine, but he had it on the desk on the seat next to him. And of course, the teacher couldn't see it. And from the front, her corner, he was dead. It was not apparent there was any light of the child at all because he's really got the message. And that is when you're yeah. dumb, when you don't do so good, you keep your mouth shut. Because if you don't keep your mouth shut, they're gonna mess on you. They're gonna do you in. And he's known that ever since he can remember. He learned to deny the sole difference between him and four-legged creatures, which is his intellect. He learned to deny even that, so that he might not hurt so much in the classes where pain is dealt as easily as language. Wentworth was a functional illiterate. Wentworth had a dreadful experience in the class in which I sat. The teacher's experience was equally bad. Each of you who has talked to has had this experience. Well, that's just what I mean. The teacher asked a question about two thirds of the way through the class. Now, she had in that class of 38 three children who customarily answered her question. Oh, 35 of the children were dead to all apparent view, not breathing apparently. And the three who answered the question, two and a half of them were girls, there was a customary verbal intercourse. <laughs> With these children, one could ask a question and expect an answer. The rightness of the answer didn't matter. It is that they were prepared to respond. Well, many classes like that have a few of them. talk classes like that, where we identify a few children who we expected to answer the question, and we ask them the question. They respond, and we say we have a Socratic dialogue. She asked a question of the right answer machine sitting next to Wentworth, one aisle close to her. Now, she usually looked in the general direction of one of the three children when she asked her questions. Wentworth had perhaps not looked up in that class for nine years. It was a ninth grade. It was an English class. He saw no way to look up. He knew there was nothing there for him. But just at the moment that she asked the question of the child sitting there next to him, he looked up. All he wanted to do was check on the world. He just wanted to look out the window. He meant to look west. Instead, he looked at worst, oh, west-southwest. The teacher, being an English teacher wearing glasses, a little cockeyed, meant to look at the kid sitting next to him. Instead, looked at the kid, Wentworth, who looked at her. They were eye-locked. The most dreadful of all classroom teaching circumstances. Honor is involved. You can't drop your eyes. If you drop your eyes, you've lost your honor. And if your honor hasn't gone before, you don't want it to go then. They, they stared at each other. Wentworth hadn't heard the question. Wentworth hadn't heard a question in English class for at least nine years. But he knew a question had been asked. He knew a visitor was in the class. He was a decent child. He wanted to get the teacher off the hook. So he said something. Anything. I don't know what he said. The teacher didn't know what he said. He didn't know what he said. Just something to keep the verbal ball moving. But it ground with dreadful ball. It turned out to have a flat side. The flat side was the fact that one word hasn't heard anything at all. And the only thing that is worse than being irrelevant in such a class is being wrong. He was wrong and the visitor was there. The teacher could not forgive that. She might have forgiven him otherwise. She excoriated him. He blushed. He went back to his reading. The class went back to their area of the the right answer machine answered the question. The class was gone. But you and I, as teachers, both know that uh, sentences were not finished. 
if you have a visitor in your classroom, you explain to your visitor when such things happen, how it is possible for the class to get momentarily out of your control. Let me tell you what happened at the end of that class. It was the single most important moment in my education and what a child literacy can be. The bell rang. Now, I grew up in a downtown area of a big city. It has since passed through various classifications, slum, redevelopment area, ghetto. At the time, there was only a poor downtown area. In this poor downtown area, you had gangs. The gangs were a way of life, literally a way of life. They were the easiest form of survival. You had a group of boys and girls who made a certain area relatively safe to play in. That's the way they really did it. And uh, you have a gang leader. Now, because you have read middle class observations about lower class children, you really don't know what it means to be a gang leader. Well, I would like to say that I grew up in the upper lower class with a lower middle class. The truth is, I just grew up in the lower class. There is no way of modifying what I grew up in. <laughs> in the lower class, there are gangs, and the gang leader quite contrary to the most popular literature, is never the best fighter. Never. And the reason for that is that good fighters like to fight. The reason they like to fight is because they're good at it. They never get hurt. It's only the classes like me who get banged up in a fight. As a result, they make and made gang leaders of the fastest kids in the gang. You know why? Because when you can't talk anymore, good fighters fight, but the fast runners run. And I was a gang leader because I knew what to do with an argument, which is run. All right, I told you that because I'm fast, I'm quick. I move quickly from one point to another in space and time. The bell rang and I sprinted for the door. Mind you, I was sitting on the door wall over there. She was all the way over here. Have you ever seen the miracle of the transubstantiation of the mass in front of you? <laughs> she sat behind that desk. She didn't move a cell or a muscle. There she was, standing in the doorway, waiting for me. <laughs> that would have taken Christian theosophy forward a thousand years to have seen that happen. <laughs> I'll never forget her explanation. Dr. Fader, doctor is used like a club in the public school. Dr. Fader, Dr. Fader, she said, Dr. Fader, I want to tell you about that awful Dr. Fader, Dr. Boy, Dr. Fader. That boy was so upset. That boy, you know why I mean Dr. Fader? Yes, yes, I said, I knew. And she said, you know why he's so mean and evil and frustrated and upset? He's so mean and evil and frustrated and upset because he He's in the ninth grade and he's 14 years old and he can't read at all. I had sat for 40 minutes and watched this kid go through a car magazine. Now, he'd been through maybe 15 pages of that car magazine in the 40 minutes, maybe less. You have got to either have an IQ of 10 or be the world's slowest picture looker to go to a magazine in 40 minutes, 10 or 15 pages, and not read. It just did not seem likely that the child was a non-reader. And then suddenly I had another piece of evidence. I walked out of the doorway into the hall, and there he was, talking to his friends. His face was open. He didn't know I was looking. He didn't know that I was stealing information from his other face. And his eyes were bright. How is it possible that a bright-eyed child in the ninth grade does not read? That is so unlikely that I decided at that point to quit we have stopped picking evidence of children's eyes. We have stopped looking and saying, that's a bright child. We say instead, there's the devil in his eyes. <laughs> and that really means that there's life in his eyes. How can we wish it other? Would we wish dullness? I have seen dull-eyed children. Nothing in the world is so effective, so desperate, so hurtful as to see a dull-eyed child. This is a bright-eyed child. I pursued him for two whole days, class after class. We had a number of confrontations, no information. Finally, after a real confrontation in the cafeteria with his gang leader, who was Cleo, they met me after school, and Cleo gave him permission to tell me what it was I wanted to know in return for certain things. And what he told me was this, I can almost quote, but I can still see the moment. On the corner of 10th and U Street in Northwest Washington, we were sitting on the corner, I was sitting at the telephone pole, he was standing to my left, and he said, yeah, I can read. He said, I've been able to read ever since I can remember, but I never want to let them know about it. He pointed to the school across the street, because if and I do, I'm going to have to read all that 
and crack they got. That is a child who had hidden himself from the world, who had learned to destroy all there was of himself in the eyes of people who could make of him because he didn't want to be made of what they wanted. These are the same children who, when I rented a Cadillac from Hertz at the Washington Airport, I didn't want a Cadillac from Hertz, but the way that I got there, I supplied a Washington every Thursday morning come on Friday and installed my program called English in every classroom in high school. And one day I got there and had no record of my reservation, which was the smallest little kind of intrusive car they had. It wasn't a good neighborhood for a white man to be in a Cadillac, and I said to myself, which is a very subtle form of discrimination. I mean, you know, those people were not like to see me in a Cadillac. So, of course, I rented the cheapest car I could find, except on that day, all they had for me was a Cadillac. They lost my reservation, and all they had was the most expensive car left, naturally. And so Uncle Sam got stuck for it. I took it, and with much trepidation, I drove it and parked it in front of the school. It made me with the kids. It never occurred to me that they feel exactly the way I felt when I was a kid. I never had a Cadillac. My old man never had a Cadillac car, it was a Cadillac. But I sure like to see people driving Cadillacs but their baby, but for the grace of God, go I. And they'd be graceful enough to give it to me later, too. <laughs> and they felt exactly the same way. And sort of made our relationship. I said to them that day, want to go for a ride? Yeah, they said, we went for a ride. And I said, look, I'd like to go back to the airport where I got this car, because I'd like to turn it in if I can. We have another car, and i got to drive the ball for a mile after school. And this car, you know, it costs 50% more than it costs to rent a Ford. So we drove to the airport, and the kids were so, so happy with that car that we got to the airport. I'd have a heart to turn it in, but I couldn't, I couldn't tell them that. So I left the car outside, and went inside, and I left them in front of the great glass wall in Washington National Airport so they could watch the airplanes. None of them, all of them having grown up in Washington within five miles of the airport, had ever been to the airport before. They were actually smashed by the sight of the plane taking off and landing. So I left them there. I went off and did the telephone booth. And I was trying to turn the car. I came back, and they were on their feet. And a cop, a white cop, was taking their name. And I said, I'm through with you. What happened? He said, These kids with you. I said, That's right. He said, They just don't belong here. He said, And every one of those kids knew exactly what he meant, which was that they were black and white men there for you. I said, what do you mean they don't belong here? What did they do? He said, well, um, and the girl, Cleo, said, we didn't do nothing. We were just sitting. I could feel my face getting hot. I could feel my neck expanding. You know, all the signs of loss of control that we all go through. <laughs> and he looked at me, and I looked at him, and I said, you take their names, and I'll take your badge number, and I have to stay here for next month to lose your job. And we looked at each other, and he knew I was dying to get him. And he was just right. And he closed his notebook, quick, holding his hand like this, and turned around and walked away. Well, I was so infuriated, I couldn't really see. Now, I had tears in my eyes, I was so angry. It's one of those moments when you know you're very close to losing control of yourself. You don't know what to do about it. I grew up in a world where all things are strong. And I never had anybody in my life as an adult that I ever wanted to smash so as that man. Well, we walked out, the kids were guided me by the elbows. And we got outside, and Wentworth said, no, Snapper said, he knows it was right. And Wentworth said, yes, he my man. I never heard that expression before. I suddenly realized what he was saying. He wasn't talking about the town. He was talking about me. But I made it in his estimation. And I suddenly realized how dreadful it was that I had made it in his estimation. He had never seen an adult who wasn't drunk or crazy stand up to the top. Never, not ever, when he was 14 years old. Those are the kinds of children I can talk about tonight. Those happen to be black. They come in all colors and shades and sizes, and you have them, and you would them. Some of you have even beaten them. We can tell you about another kind of child, a story I tell more happily, close to the home. I'll tell you about my own son, now 10 years old, who taught me another lesson. He was much younger, and he said to me one night, Daddy, Miss X is dumb. Miss X was then his classroom teacher, 
and he knew that Miss X had been my student at the University of Michigan. And what he said was a flat statement of fact. Miss X was dumb. <laughs> there, were, there was really no other way of assessing Miss X. Miss X had gotten to the University of Michigan by being well-shaped and kind. Uh, <laughs> uh, which is to say, merely that uh, she was a, a pleasant young girl who was always pleasant at the right time, and had therefore managed to survive the university. Uh, she was not bright. As a matter of fact, she was very unbright, and I was very unhappy when I discovered that she was my son's teacher. But he's not too bright either, but he's very nice, and they got along very well. <laughs> they got along very well until she blew it one day, one week in fact, but blew it sky high. Uh, my kid managed to survive to advanced ages knowing almost nothing, which is great protection for parents. But this child had some special information about dogs, because my brother is a veterinarian. He spent a lot of time in my brother's operating room. I mean, lots of time. He really knew about dogs, all ends, all products. He'd taken care of almost everything at my brother's veterinary hospital. This teacher, was teaching a unit on dogs. Now, only elementary school teachers unitize dogs, but that's indeed what she was doing. <laughs> Unitizing dogs as she was, and not being very bright, she managed to misunitize them often. It's not clear she knew that there were four legs on a dog. <laughs> and he would come home and say, Daddy, you know, Miss X said, and I don't think that's right, Daddy. Well, he couldn't read, so she was fairly safe. He couldn't look it up. But I mean, he had an idea, it wasn't right? And then he would call my brother, got the expense of my brother lives 500 miles away. And he would call my brother and discuss it with him, who, not knowing the source until I warned him, would say, who's the dummy that told you that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I had a problem. Let me tell you how I handled the problem. Don't judge me. Not at first, anyway. Let me tell you about it. And I said, that's right, Paul. Was that just dumb? And in a way, but, I mean, I could say she's not so smart, but she's not as bright as you'd like her to be. There's a lot of words I can use to describe her. The fact is, she's dumb. But she's nice. She's considerate. She's got to be one of the most considerate women I've ever met, and teacher you'll ever have. And if you let her know that you know she's not very smart, you're going to be less than she is. You wait till next year. Next year, you're going to have Mrs. Y for the teacher. Her property butts on ours. She's got two dogs. She plays the guitar. She's a real swinger. You know, she knows. You wait. I said that to my son because he can afford to wait. I said that to my son because he comes from a class of winners. He may not be a winner. Parents can damage children beyond recognition. He may not make it. But if he doesn't, it won't be because he's underprivileged. He comes from the most privileged class in society. Money we haven't got a lot of, but we have a lot of love, affection, attention, conversation, discipline. We work at taking care of each other. I think that that is the nature of being a decent human being. He has done that for a long time and will continue so to do. He is a natural born winner. He cares considerably about others. I said to that natural born winner, wait till next year. I said it to him because he can afford to wait until next year. Because, you see, he understands the very nature of the human relationship called gratification deferment. Put your kicks off until tomorrow, or next week, or next year. He understands because he can afford to understand, just like every one of you and me. That's the message we got first, which was, if you try to see how it is today, you're not going to get everything you want. You wait five years, ten years, fifteen years, you're going to have a life like daddy, a wife like daddy, a job like you're going to have whatever you define as joy that's likely to come your way. Do you realize what we say as young, promising children in our society? We say it's not very good at working with abstracts. That's a wonderful phrase. I can show you that 500 times in the literature on unpromising children. That, as one word said, is a lot of crap. Because we don't begin to understand what we mean by that word abstract. Listen, for you to work with abstracts, you've got to believe in that one dimension of existence that every one of us believes in with our full hearts and that no unpromising kid ever believes in. And that is the dimension of time. We really believe in the positive nature of time. We can't wait to get up in the morning. Tomorrow, the day after, next week, next year, those pervade our conversations. 
We can't wait for tomorrow. I hear my children fall out of bed in the morning and get dressed as fast as they can. They're infuriated with breakfast on the table quickly enough. They learn to get it themselves and get out of the house and get to school because that is really where it is. I mean, that's, that's, that's tomorrow. That's the future. That's a dimension called belief in time. And if you don't believe in time, you can't abstract information because the very process of testing and abstraction is when you can't apply it. And one of its applicable dimensions is time. If you don't believe in tomorrow, why should you wait for tomorrow? Why should you accumulate any information for tomorrow? There isn't any reason to do so, and so you don't. And we say you're dumb. We say, well, you know, not very constant child, not very good material, um, um, a, 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 a practical child. You know what I mean by practical? Don't you, Dr. Bader? You know, he's a, he's a child who, uh, who uh, has to see how it is immediately. He really can't wait till tomorrow. He's sort of here today, gone tomorrow. He uh, might be good at playing a screwdriver or hammering a nail, uh, digging a ditch, but you can't really expect him that you're not talking about the child. You're talking about what you taught the child. You're not talking about who the child is. You're talking about what you made of him. You're talking about the child whom you have robbed of hope. Listen, when I was a kid, you know what our password was? I mean, we had a passphrase in my society. And it went like this, it was an answer to a question. The question was, uh, what are you gonna be when you grow up? The answer was, oh man, when I grow up, I'm gonna be a doctor, a lawyer, the head of my clothes on those words. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the biggest, you name it, I'm gonna be it. I'm gonna be the biggest hood, I'm gonna be the biggest president, I'm gonna be, we were bounded only by our own imaginations, nothing else. We knew that if we learned what they knew, then we could be them. And we got that information to our very self. My father went to the second grade. My mother grew up in an orphanage. Didn't know how far that orphanage took the fourth grade, maybe. What they didn't know about school and all the books they never read. But what they knew was is that if we got to be like them, we could be them. We had taught 10,000, 1,000 children never to use the phrase, when I grow up. Have you noticed how it's absent from their mouths? How it never comes from them? They don't use it because they know better. Because when they grow up, it's going to be just like it is now. Nothing. And we teach them that. Uh, not we alone, but we teach them that. And so I said to my son, if you wait until next year, because I knew he would wait until next year, he could afford it. If we teach all the children who are not like us, as though they could wait until next year, that we have committed, I think, the only definable sin in this world. I don't know much about theology. I don't apply God's name easily. I don't know what that is. But if there's such a thing as a sin, then I say it is the destruction of children by trying to make them in our image. Let me tell you about another child. Another child, another lesson. I taught in a nursery school once. A long time ago, matter of less now, I used to be embarrassed to admit it. Nursery school is a peculiar place. If you have been in one lately, I invite you into one. <laughs> women who teach in nursery schools are two feet nine inches tall and short. The children are recruited from the bottom one tenth of one percent of the stature percentile. But they do that to fit the furniture that's in nursery schools. <laughs> I got a job in a nursery school because I needed cash badly. I was a graduate student in the middle of 50s at Stanford. I took anything that was available. What they wanted was a man to play with kids. What they really wanted to do was try to balance the boys with a female presence. I took the job. I couldn't believe they paid for playing with children. They did two bucks an hour for a lot of money. Then. But I found the job was not possible. I had 24 children who were three and four years of age. And the job was 23 24 as possible. The 24th part's name was David. And he was, I guess, four years old. And he was also spastic. And not like the other 23 children, therefore. The more secure children dealt with David simply by ignoring him. The less secure children would say things like, dirty, dirty, dirty David. Go away, David. You're dirty. You can't play here. Because, you see, David was spastic not only in his right leg, which he had absolutely no control of, and not only in his wrists, which when he came close to his body, he couldn't use his fingers, 
but also improve all the time for the point of view now as we know the ground. Every one of you knows the old kids, and I'm going to do the little kids. No adult can stand to see that. But what do you do about it? I went to the two ladies who ran the nursery school <coughs> my first morning. I said, I like you two bucks an hour, but I don't think I'm going to make it. Um, I can't watch that group interaction between Dave and the other kids. And uh, I said, I don't know what to do about it. Listen, they said, just join the club. We've had David for three weeks now. We're going to have to ask his mother to take him back because we don't know what to do about him either. It was an experiment. An experiment has failed. We tried everything we could think of. And the kids who are shaken by David simply cannot and will not accept it. They torment themselves and him. So three desperate people we talked. Just a thought. And I said in the process of the conversation, <clears throat> what happened when you explain David to the kids? Or what do you mean they said? These are mostly three-year-olds, not four-year-olds. How can you explain David to little children? And they don't need to understand David here. They need to understand him here. Uh, they need to know about David through their emotions, not through their intellect. That sounds so right, and that is so wrong. I think that was the first time in my life I ever knew someone instinctively knew what was said about children and their learning was wrong. Flatly and completely mistaken. I was certain that all David needed was a place to stand and a lever, and he could move the world. I just didn't know what the place was and the lever was. You see, we have for so long seen children through our own distorted view of ourselves and the world that we append to them all of our own disabilities. We say of them, they can't because we couldn't. We say of them, they mustn't because we didn't. We say of them, you can't ask that of children because what we really mean is we couldn't ask that of ourselves. We have so long clothed them in our own disability and damage that we have created them like ourselves, which is not good enough. Perhaps we were good enough for our time. But if we don't make them better than we are, what is our hope? Why do we continue? I know no way to do that. I tried David on for size. I thought the kids could take David and could be explained to about David, but they need a reason for listening. Every little girl in that place flirted with me, every little boy courted me, every kid wanted a piece of me because I was doing anything like a man for miles around. <laughs> but I gave myself to David. It was very easy to do. David needed a lot of help, and I decided that's what I'd be doing. When I read stories, I read them to David in his ear. If you wanted to hear the story I was reading, and I like to read stories to little kids, and I read them good. And if you wanted to hear the story I was reading, you had to stick your nose between me and David, and you had to smell and taste and touch and feel and discover that except for a little paralysis and a little snot and phlegm, that this was a human being like you. You could discover it, and you did discover it, because you wanted something worse than you wanted your security next to David. When we played the sandbox, David played between my knees. We made sandcastles together. You wanted to build with me, you had to sit with David. Nursery school served juice and crackers every 30 seconds. <laughs> when, when we served juice and crackers, we served them to each other, David and I. Yes, it's mud, but it's sentimental, and I don't care. That's how it was. We fed each other. You wanted to be with us, you had to be with us. They learned to take him, to be with him, to talk to him. They learned that he could explain what he was. He could tell you with drawings in the sand that the cord had come out before he had the cord. He knew what attached to his belly button and his mommies. It had come out first. They couldn't let him come out the right way, so they had to cut his mommy open and take him out, and he had lost air, he said. I don't know what the kids understood, and I don't care what they understood. Does it matter whether they saw a balloon losing air? Does it matter if they knew that the air was oxygen? Of course it doesn't matter. All they had to know was that he was a creature like them and had to be accepted like them. And if they did not, they could not give him the life they wanted. They could and did take him, as children always can and do. We have never demanded enough of children. Never, not any time, any place. The theory of teaching literacy, which I propose to tell you about now, 
demands as much of children as I can imagine, which I'm sure is not enough. Some seven or eight years ago, the Department of Social Welfare of the state of Michigan came to the university and asked the university to participate in the making of a program to teach literacy to incarcerated children, which is an awful lot of big words for trying to teach kids who are in prison schools to read and write. Nobody's ever done that successfully on any kind of a scale. Brilliant teachers always manage to have many of brilliant teachers. If you're like me, you will to be confident and if you kind of brilliant, you're likely to lose. They realized that the prison system for kids in Michigan left a whole lot to be desired, especially the schooling area. So they came to us at the university, not knowing how to handle their own students, or they asked us how to handle their students. And I finally got the job for a variety of interesting reasons, but the one that was most relevant was the man who came to see me, called me by a name I hadn't heard in 20 years. The name was a composite of several dialects, and my ghetto, we didn't speak a lot of English, but there was a lot of Russian, and a lot of Italian, and a lot of German, and smattering of several other things. And this name was made up of a couple of those languages. You could only have known it if you knew it. It wouldn't mean anything to you, even if you spoke one of those languages, because this gang not speaking much English had to correspond in various ways, and was made up of two languages. Just as I heard the name, I knew that you knew. That meant I didn't have to take my test in order to talk about the future. And we get right to the point. And his point was that you know about kids like this, you will know. Why don't you make a program for them? And I did. I took that hook right up to the knot. I mean, I have never been so fake and so flattered in my life. Because when you've gone straight long enough, you like to remember when you were pleasantly crooked. And after you've been emasculated by enough degrees, you like to remember the time when you thought more of yourself than that. And remembering that time, remembering the pleasures of it, I said, sure, I know about kids like that. I didn't know about kids like that. I'm not sure I do now, but I'm sure I didn't then. I didn't know about them, because I didn't know that they didn't know. I didn't know that they didn't talk about tomorrow and next week and next month and next year. I was going to do what innovators have always done in the schools. I was going to look carefully at myself and make a program for children. I did that. And strangely enough, the program fit me beautifully just to have to fit me the children. Now, that has never been a necessary deterrent to programs in the schools. But this was a mild deterrent to me since it didn't seem to be fitting the children I was meeting. I thought I had to go back perhaps and remake the program. In order to do that, I went to the schools, lots and lots of public and private schools, lots and lots of schools of all kinds. In fact, I visited thousands of different schools in 20 different states and three different countries. Let me tell you what I found. You must remember, and forgive me, when I went to the school, I wasn't innocent. I had to go on to high school to speak up. In my neighborhood, if you're a gang leader, you didn't have to go to high school. You had somebody who marked your presence, somebody who took your test for you, somebody who made sure that your body was apparently seen so you could play ball after school. Because the one restriction on attendance was you couldn't play any of the games that the school sponsored unless you were there physically that day. I hadn't really been to school since eighth grade. I didn't really know what schools were like. It's not that I disliked them when I did it, I might just found them painfully adequate for a lot of things. And terribly interested in having to be a good boy, which I was much less interested in than they. I thought they were supposed to teach something else. My parents were supposed to teach me to be a good boy. But the teachers seemed to think that was their primary thrust of life. And it bored me, so I quit. Now, this was 20 years later. I went to the school. I would go, for instance, to a comprehensive high school. Uh, I'm not sure what that word means, except that it seems to mean schools that have a little bit for every kid, not much for every kid. And I would, I would go to a comprehensive high school, and I would say to the superintendent who met me, or the principal, would you send me to your best teacher of the non-college family? Now, I am not only an English teacher by vocation, but by a vocation as well. I mean, if I couldn't find anything else to do in the world except teach English, I would be happy. That's how this would be. I like it. I like all the parts of it. Um, I see when I speak a great hand descending from above with a red pencil. And when I say something awkward, it goes like this. I can't swear whose hand that is, but it is indeed a great hand, and it appears, all right, we all have our handcuffs. That's fine. I see a hand. What do you see? When I said, 
I want to be taken to the best teacher of a non-college family. I saw that hand with the red pencil, and I knew why, because non-college family is a hyphenated phrase. When you have to use hyphenated phrases in English, you are speaking awkwardly. There must be better phrases, I said to myself, but I couldn't hear what that phrase was until suddenly, after several weeks, it struck me what the phrase was that I wanted, and I couldn't believe it. I want to be sent to the best teacher of the terminal that is a word borrowed from the death vocabulary of medicine. No one told the teaching world they had to take that word. No one said you have to use that to describe these children. Only teachers know enough to know what they're doing to children to describe them as terminal cases. <laughs> I mean, when you are in terminal condition in a hospital, baby, forget this world, think on the next. And that's exactly what we are saying to the kids. Forget this world, think on the next. Because you know this one isn't for you. So I said I want to be sent to the best teacher for terminal students. Every one of you should know that when I was sent, every time I asked that question, no matter what the level, no matter what the place, no matter what the time. Oh, the subject varied, the sex varied, the age varied, but the teachers all had one thing in common. Every one of them. They were the best warden, the best disciplinarian, in prison terms, the best screw in the school. I mean the cats who keep the lid down the pipes. Those are our best teachers of the non-promising children. Those who get real quiet attention in their classrooms. A real attention? Well, real quiet anyway. I mean, they are the ones who don't have trouble in their classes. They're the ones whose classes look good from the hall. They're the ones who, uh, well, you know, we can count on them. If we get a visitor, we send that visitor to them because they know what can be demanded of such children. What can be demanded of them is discipline. If they sit a little taller, walk a little straighter, look a little better, we've really done for them all that we can do. Yes, the price of discipline comes high, but not too high, because after all, if the world is not about discipline, then what is it about? It is about compassion. It is about trying to help the child who cannot help himself, for whom sitting up straight and walking straight and talking straight is nothing compared to feeling straight. When he feels good about himself and the world he's in, he can do anything you can do and I can do. And if we do not move him first to feel well about himself and what he learns, he will learn nothing from us. And he has learned nothing from us. And so I went to the classes for the unpromising children. I listened to what the teachers said about the students and their adjectives fascinated. For in addition to being called terminal students, these children were called, um, what that word? Practical students. Uh, you know, Dr. Baker, these children, um, these children, um, well, how to say it? They, they're practical children. They're, they're children who, who really, really have to have things right now. I mean, uh, well, you know what I mean. That's your reason for doing everything they do. Well, if they are practical children, and if they have to see a reason for everything that they do, tell me then, please, why only English teachers teach English? And what sort of non sequitur is that? The response always was one way or another. I don't understand the cause and effect in that question relationship. I mean, if these children are practical children, why do only English teachers teach English? What kind of relationship is there? I don't see that at all. I don't think there is much relationship there if you're talking about my kids. But if you're talking about a whole lot of other kids who do not hope much for themselves or for the future, if only English teachers teach English, i.e. literacy, then practical children will soon learn that they do not have to learn to read and write in order to survive. And they do so in enormous and increasing numbers. I listened to the answers to my question, why do only English teachers teach English? Only English teachers teach English because only English teachers teach English. Uh, because geography teachers teach geography and English teachers teach English. Because history teachers teach history and English teachers teach English. But none of that is any good when it's applied to the child who is a practical child, who wants to do only what he has to do in order to survive, who sees no reason for investing more of himself because the future is such a blur. The first premise of this very simple program became the first of two, that Every teacher in every classroom will teach English in every school for practical children to go to school. What are some of the implications of uh, making English teachers of teachers in every classroom? 
Some of the implications are simply this. And now I invite you to consider with me a dilemma which I think affects each of us. Suppose you have every teacher in every classroom teaching literacy. That is, suppose every child is asked to read and write every day by every teacher. No more than that. Only the English teacher corrects grammar and rhetoric if he or she wants to. Other teachers may have been liked, but not necessarily. But the child writes every day and reads every day in every class. But what's the implication of that? Several. Perhaps the most important, I think, is not for the child, but for the teacher. It is impossible to run such a program without intense cooperation amongst teachers. It is impossible to run such a program unless there is a constant and ongoing discussion about children, who they are, what they are, and what the subject of literacy may be. Now, I ask you to think of the single most touching word you know in relation to us as teachers. The single most poignant word applied to us. Now, we talk about children as criminal and practical. What do we talk about us as? Uh, we talk about us as professionals. We are professionals, and we are members of the teaching profession. And if you go to our conventions, you will hear that word once every 10 seconds for the full eight-hour meeting day, then once every one second for the personal meetings amongst us professionals. We are like the lady of doubtful virtue. We do protest too much. And it is perfectly clear, not believing in ourselves, we speak it constantly, as if by saying it enough, it will come true. I am virtuous, she says, and no one believes. I am professional, we say, and no one believes. Even we don't believe. We know perfectly well we're not professional. Where we know why. Let's canvas it for a moment. My two best friends are a surgeon and a lawyer. Until recently, both were located at the University of Michigan, which one of the 21 is there now. And I used to attend their convention on the campus because I'm interested in the impact of medical and legal language on the impoverished. If you don't really know what a cop is talking about when he warns you about something, gives you a justified legal warning, you can really be in a lot more trouble than you need to be. If you don't really know what it means to be afforded legal protection, which is a quote from a charge that New York City policemen used to give, I'm not sure where they still give it. In good faith they gave it, except half the people they gave it stared at it and had the vaguest idea. But you can be afforded legal protection by the court. What? All right, I'm interested in the impact of language like that upon people who don't make it. So I attended their convention. And I discovered there was a fascinating difference between doctors and lawyers' conventions and my and your conventions. And I think the difference is embodied in that single moment when we gather together in an auditorium like this, and usually two or three people give up speeches or papers or presentations. When we meet together, if an observer stood 100 yards back, he would swear the same paper had been written three times. So all he could judge would be by the quality of the applause or the quantity of if he got a little closer, he could hear the questions. And he had heard questions 10 years ago. He'd swear the questions have been transplanted every 10 years. We ask approximately the same questions at about the same level. The reception's about the same, whether the talk or the paper is good, bad, or indifferent, because we are genteel. We are humane. We don't embarrass anybody. If a guy gives a real stinker, I mean, the least you can do is applaud a little. You know he worked hard, right? You know he's stupid. Go to a legal or a medical convention. When a bad paper is given, I have seen 3,500 lawyers stand on their seats in Hill Auditorium, University of Michigan, and hiss and boo until a man left the boat. I mean, that's where it is. I mean, you know, like, we couldn't do that. I mean, you know why we couldn't do that? Because, you see, they convene wolves and rabbits, and the wolves eat the rabbits. But we convene only rabbits, and the sounds you hear at the end of our talks are not hand claps, but the patter of the tails against the chair. <laughs> We are so pitifully non-professional that we don't recognize the difference between justified criticism and simple-minded reception. Because there is no meaningful interior criticism in our non-profession. And until you have heard of a malpractice student teaching, you will have not heard of the profession to which you do not belong. 
There are six people in my department of 150 English teachers, at least six who should never be allowed in the classroom again. They don't know their subject, they don't like the kids, they are dreadful any way you look at them. I mean, they are so bad that they have international reputations. I mean, one can go to London and speak about old ex who's still stinking up the university. And everybody knows who we mean immediately. But I don't go in to see them, you see, and say, listen, old ex, if you don't make an easy way out by jumping out of the window, I'm going to get you professionally. I'm going to put you before a bar, a legal board of opinion of our own peers and colleagues, and I will drum you out of our non-profession. I don't say that because of, I'm, I'm genteel, I'm well raised. You know, I mean, if I'm like you, what doesn't want to do that sort of thing after all? There, but for the grace of what you understand. That is desperate. That is desperate. And until we have genuine malpractice proceedings in our non-profession, we will not have a profession. And we'll never have that until we have genuine, meaningful, interior criticism within our non-profession. And we won't have that until we discuss the children and the subject with as much interest and avidity as we discuss length of the teaching day, length of the teaching year, number of children in the classroom, height and breadth of salary, number of extra classroom duties, textbooks that we use, etc., etc. More important than all and any of those, and so much so that they all pale in insignificance is the child and what we teach. Those are the things we discuss last. This program aims at introducing professionalism into the classroom by introducing cooperation between and amongst teachers in discussing the subject and the child. Meeting on a weekly or even a twice weekly basis to discuss of all things the bodies we deal with and the information we try to help in. There are other implications as well for making English teachers of teachers in every classroom. One is, for instance, that the children write 30 papers every two weeks. That's 30 papers written by the worst children in the world where this program was first instituted. It was instituted in a reform school. We don't call them reform schools now, we call them training schools. We learn they'll reform anybody now, we train kids for the penitentiary. And in a training school, we try to train children to survive once they get out. The children we're trying to train to survive have, at the Maxim School, an average IQ between 80 and 85, an average age of 15, an average school working level of very young junior high school, uh, but an average reading level of about the third grade, an average police record of about that long. And that's the top of the iceberg. What that really means is they've been caught that number of times. These are all the times they haven't been caught. These are the children who wrote 30 papers every two weeks for a whole year they were at the school. One how? How do you correct all that writing? Oh, the man who says you have to correct it. Well, every education course I have ever taken has said, as a matter of fact, if you don't respond to the children's work, the children will not perform. <laughs> Did you ever ask the teacher where his evidence was for that statement? Well, my evidence is experiential, if he knows the word. I have, I mean, I have worked hard to, I understand that, I know, I mean, where's your evidence, Jack? Uh, well, I suspect that that's true. I like your evidence. There isn't. There is no evidence, there is none whatsoever to demonstrate a cause and effect relationship between what the kid does and what you respond to. None whatsoever. There's no longer an hypothesis. For the last six years, we have not been reading 25 out of those 30 papers every two weeks, and the kids have written and written and written and written. We don't need to read better, they gotta learn to write better. And what we do is restrict their writing by our reading. Listen, I've done one entirely original piece of research. You see, anywhere I claim it as mine. I went back to the hospital where my children were born. I looked at the babies in the cradles. I then looked at English and reading and librarian type teachers. And I noticed that there was only one important inorganic difference between the babies in the cradles and that type of teacher. Babies in cradles do not wear glasses. All right, now follow, please, because I'm a logical man. I therefore said to myself, obviously the babies as they grow up acquire glasses. Where do they acquire their glasses? I'll tell you a conversation I never had anymore. It used to go like this with my colleagues. Say, Dave, have you read? And I got the little orphan response. The pies got big, the pupils disappeared, 
and you can see him contemplating an interior lie. And you can see him saying to himself, and as he would say to me, well, I haven't read it yet, but I've got it on my desk, I ordered it from the librarian, uh, my wife has got it, uh, I ordered it from the publisher, I have an intention of reading it, I've read it, but I have to go to the job. Um, <laughs> any response to hide the painful fact that teachers read no more than the students they teach. Scratch an English teacher, and this is what you'll hear, scratch when you play. I got into English teaching because I like it. Read. Now, if you hear the D on the end of that light, you're all right. If the teacher says the D on the end of that light, she's all right. But normally you hear, well, I'm an English teacher because I like to read. That too is a lie. Except most of us don't recognize it anymore. The truth is, we used to like to read. And then we discovered that because we read good, we could be teachers. And then we read a lot and got the answers. And we gave back answers and we got degrees. And then we became teachers. But we have long since forgotten that we started out by liking to read. What we ended up by doing was liking right answers. And we like them so much that what we teach now is liking right answers and not liking to read. And we don't read. We can't teach the pleasure of reading because we no longer know it ourselves. We are a bookseller's disaster, as any bookseller will tell you. If he had to depend upon the teaching population for purchases of his books, he would have to go out of business. Not only do we not buy books, we don't even read somebody else's books, because we really got the message about books, and that is they are for answers. And if you don't have to have answers, why read books? And so we don't. We are the ones who are to teach pleasure. Oh no, indeed, we teach performance. The second premise of this program, and last premise, is based upon teaching pleasure. The first premise was based upon the notion that we are trying to force children to the necessity of reading and writing, making reading and writing so unavoidable, so ineluctable, so inescapable, that indeed they will have to read and write. The second premise aims at making it pleasurable. My second question was, remember the first question was, why do English teachers teach English? The second question was, why do you use those materials to teach English? It didn't matter what the subject was, the materials were incredible. And the answer was we use those materials because those are the best materials we have. We use those materials because we've got 40 years of lesson plans based on those materials. We use those materials for more reasons than I can remember and you care to hear. But by this time, I was already in the hands of my psychologist friends. And they had taught me how to ask a question, the same question a thousand times to a thousand different people, and to record the answers. They had asked me, first of all, to record what I expected to hear. But I was a fool when I did. I said, well, what I will hear is one of two answers. You look at the 19th and the 20th century version of the same answer. 19th century version is, we use these materials because they're good for the children. 20th century version is, we use those materials because the children like them. I never heard either one of those answers, and I asked the question a thousand times in 27 states. Not once did anybody ever relate the materials they use to the children's needs or desires. Because you see clearly, what we use is not related to the children, except in the sense that we understand the children. The materials we use are related to us, and therefore by default, the children. We would no more think of asking a child whether he liked the book he read than we would ask a can opener whether he liked the can it opened. Oh, come now, you say that's real hyperbole. You don't have to exaggerate the case, it's bad enough. Now, just think for a moment, will you? How do we ask the question, children, did you like the book, George? Well, we do usually ask it something like that, but what we want to hear is, did you remember the book that he read? <clears throat> George, did you enjoy reading X? Um, do you remember it was such and such and so and so? Hey, George doesn't remember, but the truth is, George liked it. Listen, some of the best parties I've ever been to, I can remember. Day, but I enjoyed them enormously. <laughs> Why do you have to remember what you do? Why is memory incumbent upon pleasure? The answer is, because it always was for us, it better be for them. Because if it's not for them, then who are we teaching? We are not making them like ourselves. We're making some uninstructed, unformed creatures. And so when we say, did you like what you read? You better be able to remember what you read, or you can't prove to us that you like it. In addition to hearing that these children were terminal and practical, I heard another adjective. Adjective that we know they're the kind of temporary things, the kind of here today, gone tomorrow. They turn over fantastic. They sort of turn you back and they're gone. So 
don't think they're losing society. They're move, moving off and easier than paying the rent. They're temporary children. Can you teach temporary, ruthless, lightweight, impermanent children with permanent, heavyweight, rooted, large material? If you can, you're a genius and you should continue to do so. We have had enough years now to demonstrate that most of us can. And so the second premise of this program is that instead of trying to make the children like the materials, we would make the materials like the children. And we use new papers, magazines, paperback books exclusively. We use no other texts. We want to try to convince the children that not only can reading be necessary and profitable, but it can be pleasurable. And if you can stick a book in your pocket, you can roll up a newspaper, you can steal a magazine, you have made one large step toward valuing something you never valued before. Now, I was a kid, we stole one of everything. I mean, the pharmacist wasn't safe to learn in that. But we never stole books. What would you do with a book if you stole it? You couldn't eat it, you couldn't drop kick it, God knows you wouldn't read it. I mean, what would you do with it? The kids who come to the Reform School at Whitmore Lake, Michigan, have stolen one of everything and ten of most things in this world. But they never have stolen books. Our earliest index in our success was the books were disappearing. <laughs> the funniest thing I've ever heard is from librarians who say, well, we can't have an open stack system with these children. Books would disappear like that. <laughs> I mean, try it sometime. Those books are so safe, you would believe it. <laughs> Listen, let me tell you about an experiment we ran in the reform school. We had a glass front case. The school is locked up like NASA at night. I mean, you know, it's like, it's like a repository of an atomic bomb. You couldn't get in there unless you were a kid or a genius. Well, the kids are both. We lock it up tight, the kids get in every night, and they were searching for things. We put in a glass front case, as an experiment early on in this whole experiment, some really ratty paper-bound books, and some handsome hardbound books. The next morning, all the ratty paper-bound books were gone. Second stage, we took the ratty paper-bound books and put the same titles in handsome hardback books. Next morning, all the ratty paper-bound books were gone. Third morning, not only did we put ratty paper-bounds in, but we put in titles that, I mean, even you wouldn't pretend to read, much less read. I mean, there were titles that I would look at twice. Nobody in the right mind would read them. And in the cover of the front hardbound book, we put a $10 bill. You had to push that hardbound book aside to get to the paperbound. The next morning, the hardbound book was pushed aside, all the paperbounds were gone, and the $10 bill was still in place. Moral of the story, you want to hide your money, hide it in the library. <laughs> <laughs> we tried to change the material. I invite you, imaginatively, if you dare, to walk with me into a school library. What do you see when you walk into a school library? If you see, not through your own eyes, but through a child's eyes. Now see now, not through the child's eyes who has plenty, but the child's eyes who has little. The child who hasn't even got enough of an ego, enough of a picture of himself, to manifest himself, who often disappears. If you look at him the wrong way. Remember him? He's Terminal, he's ephemeral, temporary, and he's practical. And if he walks into that library, what does he see? It's a disaster. And what may he see in that library is the only thing that could possibly be able to books on the shelf. It's a librarian. <laughs> All right, now I ask you to consider how librarians can reach such a remarkably advanced age. It's an important question. We've just passed a statute in the state of Michigan librarian must retire the age of 105. <laughs> I, want you to cons I want you to consider for a moment the logic of advanced age of librarians. Do we choose them out of stronger stock than we choose the rest of us? I mean, is there some sort of librarian school test where they discover your cardiovascular system is stronger than English teachers, for instance? No, there is not. Librarians last longer because they are used the best. Now, I am not now talking about their personal lives, I mean just the whole profession. Their whole professional life is what the best. How come they're used less? Not because they want to be used less, but like you and me, they really like the pedal they wear. They like the idea of just reading books most of them. We've pretty well gotten rid of library who really thought it was their life to protect books from children. Plus we got rid of English teachers who thought it was their business discipline rather than teach children. 
Uh, what we haven't got rid of is the conspiracy between English teachers and librarians to value books in the long run somewhat higher than they value children in the short run. To put that another way, what library would you really look at her library would keep her job another day if that library were made up of hardbound books with the Dewey Decimal System on the bottom of the spine and a title on the top, and kids came into that library to take those books off the shelves, and she or he knows better than anyone else that they don't take them off the shelves. They stay there forever and ever. They are a library's tragedy. We tried to make the material and the library like the kids. We introduced 20 drugstore spinners full of paper-bound books with the cover down. Look, booksellers know of us that if we buy a book, we are influenced by the cover. That's a painful truth even of the most literate book purchasers, that a good book in a bad cover doesn't sell as well as a good book in a good cover. And that a bad book in a good cover sells almost as well as a good book in a good cover. It's a painful fact of publishing that paper-bound books bought by the literati are bought not entirely, but partly on their really swinging cover. If we know this about ourselves, how can we possibly not know this about children? It is the children who relate to form and color and movement. That's their entire world. I've listened to what my children say. One of my children said for years, I'm going to turn on the pictures. The what we said? We never said that. Just going to turn on the television. But for him, it was turning on the pictures. Because as you've often seen children do, you turn his back on the words, figuratively. But it's the pictures that you're after. It's the movement. It's the form. Now it's the color. It's the shapes and sizes. It doesn't care what they say. It's how they are. If we know this of intensely verbal children, how about those much less verbal children who we want to bring to read these books? How dare we inflict those libraries upon them? We dare. Let me tell you about what change such a library can make in 